Gordon. So this is the second global conversation inside of the Lausanne for Fourth Congress Certificate Series. And what we've done is taken the 25 gaps that are part of the state of the Great Commission, organized them according to the way they organize into seven topics. And then we have seven Zoom meetings to talk about the groupings that they have in the 25 uh, gaps. And so the certificate program allows you to, to map and break down and go through this amazing report of the, the State of the Great Commission prepared by the Lausanne Movement. Uh, and it's just been fascinating. What I appreciate the way Kathy has organized it is allows us to take this massive amount of content and emails that are coming at us from all over the place and have a way to map it, organize it, and kind of take it in the priority and the topics that we choose. And I've enjoyed that. This particular week, in terms of emerging demographics, is one of the more larger weeks, we'll put it that way, in terms of topics. So we need to start with prayer. So I'm going to start with that. Father, we just thank you that you are never surprised by what's happening in our world. And we are. And as we've looked at this report, there's surprises in the way that the United Nations and others have tracked population data and forecast population and emerging population trends. You're not surprised by that. And you're sovereign over all that. And so as we think about how we respond as good stewards, uh, we know that you have preceded us. Give us wisdom today as we talk about these trends. Give us understanding and even conviction and commitment to what our part is into addressing and being good stewards of these trends. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So uh, I hope that you've had a chance to, to look at what's the content. But... Um, Basically, this week, we're talking about massive changes in global trends expected over the next 10 to 20 to 30 years and <clears throat> massive. I mean, it, the world will be different in, in 20 years than what it is now. The trends that they are tracking is aging. And as you read, the United Nations Population Division estimates that the number of persons age 65 plus is expected to double over the next three decades so that by 2050, the global population 65 plus will be 16 to 22% of the world. And so with that, global aging brings an accumulation of societal burdens, increasing economically non-productive populations, draining pension funds, and increasing healthcare needs. And so that's directly out of there. The second population trend that they track and what you read was the middle class. And in 2018, <clears throat> for the first time in human history, the majority of humankind was no longer poor or vulnerable to falling into poverty. This enormous shift has fueled the historic growth of the global middle class. And um, later on, they talk about the zeitgeist of the middle class as a consumerist uh, lifestyle fueled, fueled by discretionary income. This is the central difference with the poor. Consumerism is the engine of all modern economic systems. The most common expressions of this include, or the bad part of this, include workaholism, high levels of comfort, materialism, security, financial independence, self-sufficiency, social symbolism, and individualism. These adversely lead to detachment, isolation, nominalism, and syncretism. Um, the next trend that you read about was regional youth populations. And again, according to the United Nations, there are over 1.8 billion young people in the world today, accounting for 16% of the global population, 90% of whom live in developing countries. And then there's a whole series of articles and podcasts on that. Another trend that we read about was Islam, the growth of Islam, uh, but it, it, a lot of the, it's the only growing religion and it's being spread outside of the Middle East, North Africa, and through migration streams uh, is going throughout the world. And uh, one of their quotes that they said is the growth of Islam requires the Christian church to understand it accurately. Some nations are secular, others enforce sh Sharia law. Some protect Christian minorities, others discriminate against them. Also among Muslims, there are some of the richest and poorest people in the world. In addition, Muslims occupy a generally diverse spectrum from world-class scholars to terrorists. Um, and then another trend we read 
about was secularism. The secularization of a society can be recognized by the weakening of religion and the mindsets of the citizens, both in social mores and in public institutions. Um, and then on top of that, then there's more trends that talked about Asia, Africa, radical politics, right to freedom, religious persecution, and opportunities for people with disabilities. So that is our topics today. Uh, there's no way we're going to keep up with all that, okay? Um, and so given our limited time, I want to, and the fact that we don't have a large group here, if it was a larger group, I would have broken you into um, discussion groups based upon what you wanted to talk about. Um, but we have a small enough group that says we can talk about it. So those are the topics that we can talk about. <clears throat> and I will follow the lead if whoever wants to jump in. Um, who would who would like to pick one of those topics we can talk about for the first 10 to 15 minutes? Pick a topic and we'll jump in. Secularism. Right. Belaiti, which one do you want? Uh, the rise of secularism. Okay. Okay. So the, the rise of secularism is the idea that, um, you know, in the pre-modern world, um, everybody believed anything that happened was caused by a God of some sort. And so religion, faith, all religious activities was a public and it was part of the culture. Uh, in the West, the rise of modernism basically said science proves everything and you can you don't have to believe in God. And so we had modernism and then of course now postmodernism, <clears throat> whatever is post postmodernism or whatever we want to call it now. But what happens is over that time, <clears throat> not just in the West, but now it's happening in other places. What used to be a culture of, of religion, where the whole there was public religion began to be more about people doing that privately and not publicly. And then as that happened, all of a sudden religion is no longer a dominant force in politics, community, society norms. And as younger people come in, they uh, religion, whatever that may be, and I'm not talking about just Christianity, but just any kind of religion becomes an option and maybe an option they don't choose. And so obviously in the West and the United States, we see more what's called nuns, where they say, we, I'm not none of the above when offered a religious uh, option. In India, the youth population is, um, one person told me, you know, he handles a, a call center in, in the Bangalore. <clears throat> and he said, you've got to realize that in one year, I make more money than my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, and my great-grandfather made in their whole lifetime. Okay, and these stories of Hinduism, they feel like cartoons. And so as but I don't really know what to do with them. I'm not I'm so distant from my parents culture, but yet I don't necessarily want to adopt a Western culture or Christianity. So I'm stuck in the middle. I don't believe in Hinduism. I don't believe in Christianity. I don't believe in the culture of my parents. It's a new culture and it's a youth culture of those of us that run call centers in, in Bangalore. And so we're seeking consumerism, but we're also seeking scientific and material uh, answers to what our needs are, practical answers, and we don't have a need for religion. Um, so it's not just Christianity. So that's secularism. And so <clears throat> how do we address that when you are um, both in our own lives? Because even though we say, oh, that's influencing the world, actually it influences us. And so um, I've heard uh, another story where we would laugh at the people in the Middle East, at the Middle Ages, and the, where they would say, uh, the monks would argue, how many angels can dance on the head of a pen? And we laugh at that, how backward are they? And the response is, the fact they saw angels around them actually probably made them more connected to reality than us. And we are, we while we're Christians, we are not always aware of a whole religious, spiritual world that's going on around us that perhaps is right in front of us or invisible. And previous generations were more connected to the reality of the spiritual world. We're distanced from that. So secularism is not just something about evangelism. It's also about our own mindsets and our own way of seeing Christianity through a secular mindset as it creeps in without us recognizing that. So that's our problem. Um, any thoughts about that? How does that address our own our Christianity, 
how does that address how we uh, talk to people in evangelism? How does that address as we project and as leaders uh, Christianity through social media, how we how we shape Christianity in the world to articulate it, perhaps in a new expressions that we haven't seen before? Secularism. Any thoughts on that? Okay, right. Go ahead. I, I think um, the issue is more pronounced in Europe and North America more than anywhere else. Uh, so the case in point is um, people are almost running away from churches. Uh, and to, to the extent that you know, at some point, for example, in Buffalo, last time I was there, uh, like six, seven churches were closing. Right. They closed them. Uh, I remember one kid. There was a, a Hungarian church in, in upstate New York. People of Hungary, Hung descent of Hungary, used to own it. So as people are members of that church continue to pass away, pass away, get older and older, they reached a point where there were like 10 or 12 people left. Those people couldn't handle the maintenance and the energy cost of the building, so they had to sell it. And I remember another group buying that church. Some people are buying those buildings for business purpose. So, so this is a, a problem, an issue that we should uh, you know, think about and worry and uh, do something about it. So I see the okay, rise you know, of gonna, secularism. I'll, I'll, so I will push okay. back at you, okay? Uh, okay, go ahead. A little bit. So the fact that people aren't going to a church service on Sunday morning may not be the worst problem, okay? And I'm, I'm now getting heretical. Because in the United States, and it's affected a lot of other countries, um, the, the, we have, I have a friend that says, the church is supposed to be a body that looks like us, and is a head and arms and hands. But in the United States, the church has become one gigantic mouth, little bitty arms and little bitty heads and no ears. And so what happens is it may be the fact, and you'll see this in the article in Secularism, about the church gathered and the church scattered. And um, <clears throat> maybe we have been so enamored with the church gathered, celebrity preachers, talkers, building buildings, so much money going into buildings and staff and smoke machines and worship and and lights and all that on Sunday morning, that maybe closing churches may not be our worst problem, okay? And it's more about how do we engage our society in as, as Christians, not necessarily having our country club meetings on Sunday morning. And so the fact that churches are closing, that's bad, but there's a part of me that kind of goes, that may be a correction, okay? And then let's move to like Jonathan. Is Jonathan in Singapore? He's seeing he's seeing secularism. I know he is. In China, uh, mainland China, they're seeing the same thing. So is young people grow in their economic status, ancestor worship, uh, Taoism, all those things that influence their their parents is just not influencing them at the same level. Same thing in India, like I described. Now Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, you're the only nation in the world that has had an influence of Judeo-Christian culture since the time of the Queen of Sheba, right? You were probably the most influenced culture ever uh, in terms of even more than, than uh, Israel, which you know, disappeared and came back um, than anybody else. So that may, this secularism may affect you later than some other places in the world, but I think it's very influential in other parts of the world as well. And so let me stop at that point. Any thoughts on that in terms of secularism and how it's affecting your own culture, whether that be Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Singapore, um, uh, Guyana, uh, Pakistan. Good, Brian. One of, yeah, one of the, well, there's not rampant secularism yet in, in Ghana, but one of the great risks uh, in, um, in, in, um, in some, Pentecostal churches is the rise of simony and uh, where uh, where we're seeing uh, where we're seeing Christian leaders seeking to exploit the faith 
by all sorts of absurd practices uh, that they're trying to induce people into. And uh, an older generation is gullible, but there's a coming generation that is not gullible. And, and the young generation is not is not so gullible, but they're seeing all of this. And of course they react and interact on social media uh, and they begin to decry some of the nonsense that they're seeing with, with selling of detergent and, uh, and the blessings of oil and, uh, uh, and, and the use of, um, uh, of fruit juice uh, being, being promoted as the healing blood of Jesus and all of this stuff. And they're watching this, they're seeing this, and they're commenting on it with each other uh, on on all of their in all of their different groups and WhatsApp groups and Facebook groups. And the risk there is that you'll have a generation that that is that is already disillusioned with with Christian faith and with the genuine miracles that can come through prayer. And that can come through, and that can come through the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, and so the power of the Holy Spirit is being demonstrated in so many parts of West Africa, and so now the enemy is trying to raise the old technique of of simony to discredit the the truly miraculous presence and operation of the Spirit. So that that becomes that becomes a concern. So in Ghana, we... in Ghana, are the young people becoming cynical and becoming secular, or are they saying we're not going to buy into this craziness? We're going to create our own spiritual expressions that are maybe healthier. Which way are they going, or is it all always? I think I think it's more in the direction of dissolution. That makes sense. They're they're cynical, and, and... As, they're cynical. They're they're, they're cynical, uh, and. Uh, and as we get globalization through the net, then um, they're, they're going to be harder to reach with the gospel. Anyway, I'm ra I, I was ranting. I apologize. But, it, but, it's, but it's something that you see. And how do you counter this without being denounced as being, as being uh, atheistic or, or some nonsense like that, which is the coin that people, that these guys will use to try and discredit their critics, uh, and uh, so that, it's a problem. that's it's a problem. Yeah. And it creates church hurt, meaning people are hurt by the church and its craziness, and that yeah. drives yeah. them to secularism. And uh, yeah. and it's yeah. not just it's not just church hurt on the church gathered; it also gives them a lack of hope in the church scattered. And so they don't they don't employ their spirituality, their following of Christ in the workplace. So. It's a real yeah. problem. A real it's problem. a real problem. Anybody else? Uh, uh, One of the things, sorry. Oh. Joy, go ahead. Go ahead, Joy. One of the things we're seeing in Guyana, the Muslims, they are giving money to people. And I believe it's one of the ways they're attracting people. They give money every Fridays. So a lot of young men are going towards that. And we see young men turn into Hebrew Israelite and, and then with uh, with their thoughts about, about slavery and, and how that has impacted human development some, and, and how Christianity was misused in that context, some seem to be turning away, you know, to false religion. That's some of what we've been seeing in the culture. And what you said to, but to me, in addition to church hurt, sin at the level of leadership. Sure. And so in the Caribbean, um, as you know, you're facing a shortage of pastors. Young people are not wanting to be pastors. And it's a critical, critical shortage. Guyana has a very strong Hindu population, as well as Muslim, as well as Christian. You have a unique situation in, in Guyana uh, that some other countries of your size don't have. And so there's going to be different strategies. And so one good strategy we read about is what if the church was not about bringing people in to sing at them, talk at them, and have the church gathered? What if instead of giving money, we invested in young people to be able to build their businesses, give them entrepreneurship training, 
help them to understand how to make an economic difference. That's going to actually be very powerful. But sometimes we're the, spending the so much of our... Go ahead. No, sorry, sorry. No, I'm hearing you say meet them where they're at. Yes. Rather than bring yes. them in to talk to them, go out to them. Yes. Which means we have to scale back the church gathered or adjust it so that it is flowing into the church scattered. And you'll see that in that article. It's pretty clear. And it's a rethinking of church. Um, church may be, if, we're, if God so leads us, we may, church may look very different in 20 years than it does now. And that may not be a bad thing. So, but let's say you were going to speak. Joy, uh, thank you for that yes. comment. So thank you. Um, the rise of uh, communism, communist political ideology and perspective, you know, until until the 19, early 90s, uh, was a strong force against, you know, religiosity. But after 1990, with the decline of it, do we see any, you know, increase in terms of religiosity, as especially among the former uh, you know, socialist countries, Eastern Europeans, and, and other places? It's, it's a kind of question as well as remark. So as you know, one of our founders was Jember Tefera, okay? Her husband was the mayor of Addis Ababa when the revolution happened. Her great uncle was Holly Selassie, okay? Uh, and she spent time in prison. I think from her perspective on Ethiopia, and I, I think it would be other people would mirror this. And I, this is a very short statement, okay? So recognize I'm just throwing something out there. It, it needs a lot more complexity. But there probably is not, communism is really not necessarily real. It's autocratic leadership. And it's hidden under the vein of communism. And so, and this goes into radical politics. So what happens is you say communism, and there's some real things that are happening there. It's an ideology, but what results is authoritative leadership. And you certainly see that in Russia, you see that in China, you see that in most communist countries, it's authoritative leadership. Now I can critique democracy too, whatever that is. We don't really have democracy either. And so some of the battles that are happening right now is the difference between authoritative leadership, and we see that increasing in China, uh, in response to crisis, in response to radical politics. And so, um, and ultimately, and I would say in Ethiopia, it was authoritative leadership more than it was communist. And, uh, but it was hidden by, you know, you say, you say that so that people don't see that you're really an authoritative leader. And I think, then again, going into another topic that we talked about in that reading, radical politics, there is a very strong campaign, and China has made it a good argument for we need authoritative leadership. Notice they're not using the term communism as much, but authoritative leadership. And we think that that's the more important type of leadership in political systems in Africa, in the Middle East, around the world. Because if you don't have that, you're going to have this thing that's happening in the United States that just everybody is, it's judges. Everybody does what's right in their own eyes. And there's an argument for that, okay? I would say it's not communism against democracy. It's authoritative versus whatever we have here uh, under the label of democracy. And I'm not sure I even know how to label it. I'm throwing out, so, I'm throwing out hard stuff. Just, I, you know, you don't have to agree with me. I'm trying to get some controversy here so people start arguing with me and each other. That makes a better conversation. So I, 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 remember, I remember in Ethiopia um, until uh, early 1990s, since in the mid 70s, the military government was closing some monasteries, some churches. Mm -hmm. The same thing happened in, in former Soviet Union. Many of the monasteries were closed during those 70 years of you know, communist rule. Mm -hmm. That's happened. Pierre, you had your hand raised, so jump in. Good. Okay, uh, I, I agree uh, uh, mostly with all that you've just said, and uh, I would like to comment a bit about the authoritative uh, leadership you're referring to. And I think I see this actually in uh, the Ivorian context, especially in the church. Uh, what uh, the Pentecostal movement that uh, um, Jenning was referring to recently I have actually a friend who is a pastor coming from that movement, 
And the first time I went to his uh, congregation, I was shocked pretty much uh, to see other older uh, Christian people older to be his parent, calling him uh, father. Yeah. And when they put me, calling me father, I was kind of like, I don't know what to do here. And they said, in our church, we call our pastor father because he is the one uh, looking after us. And so I did not get in the discussion. And then at some point after the uh, worship service, I, I just told my friend, well, you know you and I, we are, we are friends. You are my big brother, but I can never call you father. So uh, I'm not going to get in, in this. But that's, uh, I respect your position, but I'm, I'm a bit short. And in that movement, you can find that whatever the uh, father of the church says, everybody has to, to come along. And this is growing, actually, the Pentecostal movement is growing rapidly in uh, uh, West Africa and especially in, in Ivory Coast. And there is pretty much another conflict between the, uh, the, the older church, like all the evangelical, uh, ancient evangelical movement and the Pentecostal movement. And there is such a clash that uh, it's very difficult to, to collaborate. And this is where it breaks my heart to see that instead of uh, moving towards uh, the main thing, which is uh, making uh, disciples in country, the church has turned around and become a political entity uh, where we fight over who gets the most power. And and this is where I don't really feel fit anymore in the Ivorian context. When I go work, I just focus on what I can do uh, through my ministry and just leave all the politics uh, aside. So that was about the uh, authoritative leadership. And I'm wondering what can be really done uh, Especially for a younger person like me, with the leadership training, when you go out, the pastors and other people, they, they've seen you uh, grow up in that church. They know you by heart, and they just don't see what, what else you can bring to them. Yeah. So this has brought me to think that what I can do in my trainings and whatever I'm doing is to really focus on the younger generation. And I was pretty much encouraged this uh, <laughs> week to uh, hear the um, Pearl G from India in the videos, the podcast, saying that they're actually working on uh, training children uh, to be uh, leaders. We, we should see them as leaders now and not for tomorrow. And I thought that was really encouraging. And really wise. Yeah. That's really wise. I thought she had a really good point there. So just yeah. a couple of responses before we go to Brian. Evangelicals and, and Pentecostals, Pentecostals are supposed to be evangelicals, okay? <laughs> They're not supposed to be in opposition. And so what is an evangelical? They believe that God revealed himself in God's word. They believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. Um, they believe in um, the Holy Spirit. And they believe in doing social good as a result of the kingdom, call to the kingdom. That's an evangelical. And it doesn't, there's nothing in being an evangelical that says you speak in tongues, you don't speak in tongues. Um, and so Pentecostals and evangelicals are supposed to be the same. And that's that sometimes is divided. The yeah, issue, 
Yeah, I know. But in, but in Cote d'Ivoire, I see a, even sometimes there are meetings that uh, other evangelicals will not even want the, the Pentecostal movement to, to, to be part of. And I think that's really sad. That's that silliness, and the, the youth need to get rid of that, okay? You know, because it is silliness. Um, but what what Brian is talking about is an issue that even came up in the in the New Testament, right? That Paul talked about just crazy people using the gospel for their profit and their benefit. It's happened for two thousand years, and yet the gospel has survived. The church has survived, so it's going to keep happening. But I do think your strategy of working with the youth, and uh, and part of it is your own calling. When will God call you back to Cote d'Ivoire? Uh, what will be your role there? And part of your role is to stay clean and don't act like one of those. But as God is shaping through conversations, maybe your role is to work with the youth. Um, and you have a, I think you have a prophetic spirit uh, you're willing to confront. Um, Joy is very prophetic too, by the way, more than I am, willing to both confront, but also be a man of peace, a woman of peace. And so, um, you have to kind of figure out because your role will be different than somebody else that has a different set of gifts. Um, but this is the whole point of these conversations to shape what is your role, what is your calling. But I love what you're describing in terms of working with the youth as you got from Pearl. I thought her model was excellent. So Brian, what are you thinking? Okay. Um, I was, I've been alarmed too as you notice by some of the some of the developments in um, in West African Pentecostalism, but but I'm a charismatic, and you know I, I uh, and it seems to me that one of the wonderful things in uh, in West Africa has been you know the manifestation of the spirit in in the land, but. Um, some of the forms, some of the expressions of Pentecostalism that we've seen are very, very ambiguous. Uh, and so I began to go back and and uh, I just had an impression from the Lord, look, there's more than one Pentecostalism. And if we go back to Azusa and we look at Seymour, we see a very, very different thing from what we're seeing in many places now. It was grassroots. It was bringing all of the nations together. The color bar was washed away in the blood in this in 1906. Uh, and to see some type, some kind of return from that. And as I began to read and study, it seemed to me that what we're seeing now is a very, very transactional religion. It's all about what you can get, what the Holy Spirit can can get, can do for you, and it all has to do with the infiltration of prosperity into the Pentecostal movement, which was not there originally. It was a holiness movement. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, what can we do to re to recultivate the religion of the heart? So that so so that so that what we're seeing is a relational uh, connection with God rather than a transactional relationship with God. And because of the dominance of the prosperity gospel, we're seeing so much of this transactional relationship. Fast, not to deepen your relationship with God, but to get your miracle. Pray until you get your, you know. So, so all of the spiritual disciplines have been subverted to, to make them transactional and, and there, thereby actually draining them of their spiritual power. And so... How do we how do we get that spiritual power back again through the religion of the heart, which is one of the reasons why uh, I, I my focus is now uh, much more on on spiritual formation because that's the key. We 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 have to we have to reconnect with the with the with the origins of the movement with with with, with the yearning for the Holy Spirit from the heart. Uh, and that's that's the reconnection that we have to make, I think. Amen. So a lot yeah. of the articles, a lot of the articles talked about holistic disciple making. A lot of them, that was the solution if you look at all those articles. And so I'm gonna move us a little bit. Uh, we talked about the aging population and they said to address the aging population, you need holistic disciple making. That was their answer. For the youth, it was holistic disciple making. 
to counter the growth of Islam, holistic disciple making, um, and, and even secularism, holistic disciple making, which means church gathered, church scattered. It's getting away from just talk and head into life. And that was almost every article somehow mentioned that as a solution. So let me stop at this point. We learned in that those articles that the growth of uh, the, the aging populations will have a gigantic economic society effect around the world. And uh, some of the places where that's going to be the biggest impact would be China. Uh, I talked about that's going to be huge in terms of just the disruption of China as a relation of that. Um, in India, they talked about the growing youth. Okay, In Africa, 90% of the youth will be in Africa. So the huge growing of youth. So these two things are happening in juxtaposition to each other. I thought the charts they showed us in the article are amazing. Is I'm just gonna, a quick, quick question. <laughs> How many of you personally feel called in your own life, in your calling to minister to the aging population as one of the top three callings of your life? How many would say that? Sorry, I'm raising my hand. Okay. How many would say youth would be that? Raise your hand. Okay. How many would say Islam, dealing with Islam, would be one of the top three? Okay. Okay. And that makes sense, Sahida, in Pakistan. My goodness. Um, how many would say secularism is one of your top three callings? Is, okay. How about people with disabilities? Those opportunities we read about. How many would see that? Okay. Okay. Yes. Kathy, of course. Yes. Um, um, and then, of course, we have geographic callings of Asia and Africa and that sort of thing. So we're kind of spread out here. Sahida, I'm going to ask you, and I know you're driving, so we supposedly say uh, people don't uh, encourage people to Zoom and drive at the same time, but you look like you're doing okay. If it doesn't bother you to drive, do you have anything you want to share with us about just your calling to Islam? And as you read the article, I thought the article did a phenomenal job of saying, we not need to be scared of Islam. Of course, you know, that's easy to say if you don't live in Pakistan. Uh, but we need to connect with Islam and understand what's going on and that it's a very diverse movement. So, Sahida, any thoughts about Islam? We'll go ahead. Uh, by the way, I'm not driving. I'm sitting at the back seat, which is good. But I'm sorry, my internet was not good in the car. So it was just disrupting again and again. So anyway, um, being in a, a highly populated Muslim country, uh, the Christians are less than 2% in Pakistan, which makes maybe 1.6 or 7% Christians. And uh, being with uh, Muslim students in school, from the childhood, I was the only um, Christian student in my school, in my junior school. Mm -hmm. um, I feel that there is, there is need to share the message. There are, on, on the one hand, there are people who are genuinely seeking um, righteousness and uh, the truth. And on the contrary, there are people um, who are becoming more and more anti to Christianity here. Um, we get some opportunities to share the gospel or to share our faith. But in, in this last decade, more opportunities we had 20 years ago, they are minimal or they are becoming less and less. Hmm. Um, in small groups, we, uh, in my um opinion we used to do um at easter time evan evangelism in my in my area where we are wor working our thematic area our ministry area and 
10 years ago, we distributed all this material, but um, sadly, my brother was arrested. Two other young members of our team, they were arrested and they their phones were taken away from them. So we couldn't trace them all night. They were in at the police station and so we couldn't get in touch with them. And uh, we obviously you can imagine how terrible situation it was that sure. maybe 8%, seven, seven people in the team together and they were searching and wondering where our three members are at the moment. So anyway, the next day, um, God helped us to find out that we we were able to trace them at the police station and they were going to um to sue them for the pers the blasphemy law and all that sure. so this is something very difficult at the moment whatever we want to do even a kind gesture as in the floods i do remember that 2 years ago in Sindh, in near Karachi, when we had devastating floods. Mm -hmm. So from my organization, Noor Ministries, we were able to send some support. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, 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 the key people in that area, uh, they said, don't put any track or any literature in your packages when you are packing uh, Russian or uh, toiletries or anything, because we can be in trouble by the Sindh government. Mm -hmm. Whereas it used to be very easy 10, 15 years ago when we were distributing gifts to young children, we used to put little Christian stories published by a Christian um, writer or Christian publishers and and some tracts and all that things. But it's becoming very difficult day by day. And now we don't do any evangelism, open evangelism in our area, because if we do that, our school will be sealed, our ministry will be sealed and we might be uh, trapped into uh, the blasphemy law so this is sure. this is one thing very prominent and very scary that even we do a kind gesture towards muslims we are um they try to trap us into blasphemy law they want to they 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 turn the story um for their own meanings or for their own purposes and put people into blasphemy law or all these cases so but still thank god there are some seekers genuine seekers which is good news and and we always pray, praise God that even in these circumstances, God has put hunger in some souls and they are seeking. And my dad's friend, he was from a Shia family. So he, he was a, a homeopathic doctor in our, in our area. So he got Bible from my dad, but he didn't put the Bible in, at his home. So he put the Bible, he wrapped into so many uh, folds or layers in a cloth and put it, hide it in his drawers where he was able to read it. And uh, so there are people like this. So uh, but people cannot disclose, people cannot share their story, people cannot join the 
big churches, people who are seekers, they cannot meet uh, openly to other Christians. If they go immediately, they will be they will be traced or tracked by some Muslims and they can be in trouble. So it's very hard for them if they are Benman seekers. So part of your role is in Matthew 10, be shrewd as a serpent, innocent as a dove, uh, at a level that some of us that don't live in countries where uh, Islam is the predominant uh, cultural influence, political influence, and religious influence. And um, I think one of the things we saw in every article is it does mean we've got to change how the church expresses itself. And um, and I think that every article we read says this is different. We have to the young people. It's being relational. Um, and, you know, we did a project in Kandahar. Where we put a polyclinic in and we couldn't identify it as Christian. Yeah, we had Christian doctors there. And before it got blown up, uh, it, it, it had about probably 120,000 women, uh, because the men weren't going to the hospital that went through it. Every one of them knew as Christian, even though they couldn't put out tracks and articulate it. And as you're witnessing, as you're out there, you may not be able to put the tracks, and there's a stewardship of it. How do you identify as a Christian? Um, but people know. People know the relationships. People know. And you have to be pro proactive on how you do that. But that takes a new level of shrewdness. One of the things that we've thought about is the Great Commission, okay? And the the um, this study is the uh, the report of the Great Commission, right? But if you think about it, that phrase was never used until about 1840, as best we can tell. And the phrase was developed by revivalist preachers, evangelists. And when it says, when Jesus in Matthew 28 doesn't say, I'm about to state the Great Commission, that term Great Commission is added to your Bible uh, by, by the 18, no, after 1840. And Jesus does do a commission, but he says, teach them all that I commanded you. He talked about the kingdom all over the place. And we would argue that the, the commission of Matthew 28 is a restatement of the commission of Genesis 1, but now in a fallen world. And so it's really about the kingdom. Now, the kingdom was divided uh, in a secular world of saying you have the proclamation gospel and the social gospel. That's not the kingdom. The kingdom is the two together. But I think we're going to see as Christianity and the tone of Christianity, the emphasis of Christianity will have to and will, because God precedes it, change as a result of these demographic changes we're seeing. Islam, younger, older, Asia, Europe, I mean, Asia and Africa, that we will see Christianity being more holistic. Uh, it doesn't negate the proclamation of the gospel but there's going to be a lot more demonstration of the gospel that goes with it that's relational. And I think that's going to be the Christianity of the next several decades reacting to that. And part of our task, that means the church gathered in the big church gatherings will be less important or they're going to be more, more important, but focused in a different way to facilitate the church gathering, breathing in, the church scattered in intentional ways, breathing out. And I think you, we're going to see examples of what you're doing in Pakistan will lead the rest of us because you have a certain shrewdness, a certain constraints that will you will probably innovate before we will because we don't have those constraints. Um, and yet that we're going to learn from you because of that. So I think it's a it's a big change in Christianity is coming because of these demographic changes. God knows that. God's already preceding that. It's our job of how do we help young leaders not be scared of it how to help older leaders and emerging populations to embrace it and to help the young leaders because they'll come up with the new models. I think we're all stuck in our in our boxes right now. And so it's a it's a huge challenge. But I think we're going to be learning from countries like yours, probably that you'll teach the rest of us. Now, on this call, we have the majority of people here are uh, Francophone Africa. Uh, you're the biggest group. OK, Martine is our uh, Ph.D. director of BGU. Uh, Douglas Barnett is uh, did a, spent a lot of spend of time in Cote d'Ivoire as well. So, any thoughts from Francophone Africa about what you read in the, about Africa, about secularism, about the rise of the youth, about Islam? Any things from uh, and Pierre, of course, is is uh, is uh, Cote d'Ivoire as well. Any any words from Francophone Africa? Any response to what you read in our articles? Hey, Doug, go ahead. Hmm. 
Um, hi, Brad. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm catching up because uh, I'm afraid I, I learned of this course uh, just a few days ago, despite all of the widespread communication about it. <laughs> More's um, coming. We're going to keep flooding your inbox, Doug. It's just going to happen. Okay. Um, but I did read earlier about the demography of Africa, <clears throat> and I was um, blown away by the fact that two-thirds of the world's youth or, or children will be coming out of Africa by the year 2067. Yep. And uh, it just seemed to me uh, most of us won't be here uh, when that time comes provided the Lord hasn't returned yet. Um, but now would be a great time to expand on children and youth outreach and discipleship. It's a very long-term question. Um, the, the other issue though, is a lot of the youth in Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan as well as North, will be coming from Muslim families. Mm -hmm. And so there may be an opportunity to reach them there, but uh, you know, there is uh, this polarization even now um, in Africa. I, and I just wanted to comment on uh, Dr. Jennings' um, uh, observations about Pentecostalism and prosperity gospel. <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm a little out of date in regards to what was going on in, in Cote d'Ivoire, but I've always been very impressed with the Assemblies of God as a charismatic denomination, not so much Pentecostalism, but they have very strong uh, theological education, and I've not seen them, you know, tip over as much into the prosperity gospel. So there may be something to learn from uh, the AOG in terms of their discipleship and how they, and and I I, I would agree that the Pentecostal and charismatic churches are much more aggressive in their evangelism and outreach, and they're growing faster than the less charismatic churches. Sure. And that's true in a lot of places. And I'm excited about Pierre as he's been, you know, he listened to uh, some things as he's thinking, maybe God is calling him to specifically target youth and young children. And I think there's a, there's a strategy in that uh, that could cross over a lot of these things in, in terms of even Islam, as you've indicated. As we get to the top of the hour, Jonathan, you have done an amazing job of staying awake because it is very late for you. So, Jonathan, I'm going to ask you because you always are good at coming up with stuff and and you don't have to tie it up in a bow that we don't we don't leave it in a bow. You can just and then we say, OK, goodbye. Um, so anything you want to share that you've observed over the last hour, uh, bring to point or just even raise more questions as we leave. Questions are not necessarily have to be answered. So, Jonathan, go ahead. Thank you very much, Brad. Um, it's just that it's a long day and I just finished facilitating for a strategic planning for a church. So my brain is almost half fried along the way as well. But I was a hardworking student. So I did my readings this week compared to last week. And so I have less questions because I've done my homework. Um, what I did was that I went one step further and I decided to integrate some of my thinking into the forum page. So, so I, I think one of the comments I have after hearing this is that, uh, I, at least I feel that when, we, when I read um, this week's session of demographics, right, um, I decided to pen it down to say that, do I see the pieces as distinct pieces or I see the pieces as intercorrelated? Mm -hmm. So I attempted to, to merge the pieces together instead of seeing two evils as bad, I decided to use two evils to serve each other. And so, so I attempted by looking in terms of the uh, rising aging population in Asia versus the youth in uh, Africa. And I decided, hmm, is there a way that we can integrate those two together, uh, bring the mentorship that's cross-cultural behind it as well? Uh, it's like, uh, going journey to the west, the gospel has moved westward, and so now Asia is bringing the gospel back westward to Africa as well. So I think that's one interesting way of looking at it as well. I also try to integrate what we talk about uh, polycentric resources, 
And uh, my last challenge was from last week was a comment that I put in the forum in page or so is that I'm not sure whether I agree with BAM as it what, what it is today, business as mission. I feel that if you if you subscribe to more willingness and humility to understand the receiver, then I think BAM serves the needs of the people who is giving more than the person who is receiving as well. So I, I, I countered by saying that I think BAM is anti-polycentric resources. But, but I felt that that concept could be applied in this week's lesson and says that if we believe that there is uh, aging Asian and the richest are coming more from Asia now, that's what the data shows as well, right? Uh, then maybe there's a need to move westward and is there any way that we can bring uh, the businesses from the east to Africa? and in the process uh, address what I call authentic and practical needs as well, right? Because the, the, res the result shows that the youth are looking for authentic relationship, not just uh, a clergy or spoken about it as well. And I felt that, at, and from my bias backing, I'm a business person and looking at it, I felt that the most authentic way is to make it happen in the business world. So uh, the ability to bring business over uh, addresses not just um, uh, the the challenges that was written in the report. The ability to bring business over actually was also reinforced in the recent uh, IMD survey. IMD is a Swiss business school that talks about uh, business as good opportunities in Africa too because of the same reason, the young population as well. So, so if we are able to integrate some of these things, then we will not see as disparate pieces, but actually... Uh, or we start worrying about it in isolation, but actually, actually, we can start integrating it and see those things as opportunity. I think that is the the, the comment that I had in the forum page. So, Brad, thanks for uh, giving me a chance to speak. I think I've spoken too much already. Maybe I should open up and say, uh, anybody want to? And I think your, Brian raises. Your analysis never disappoints. I see your hand, Brian, but I'm going to go ahead and close this down. So, guess what? Kathy always has the last word. So Kathy, it looks like people want to keep talking, right? So you show them how to use the forum because there's actually a forum that's set up on the, the to, to continue this conversation. So Kathy, you get the final word and uh, show us how to do that. Tell us about next week and then uh, close this in prayer. So Kathy, go ahead. Okay, so when you log into the LMS and there's a few people that haven't been able to get into the course yet. So I will work with them when we're done, when we close out in a second to get in there. But when you log in, you'll come over here to my courses and your the passport to accelerating mission will be here. So, so first to continue the conversation, you'll wanna to go to the forum up here. And specifically, if you wanna talk about the things we've been talking about today, this is where Jonathan was posting. So you can see he's posted a long thing where he's processing his thoughts. So please, you know, obviously re reply to him, post your own thoughts, get in there. Um, if you were able to come last week or if you want to watch the recording, you can always come back here and look at this um, as well. And then um, so over here in home is where you'll find all of the content. So uh, it, when you, when you do get into it, you can go through it and understand. Here is the list of the, the Zoom meetings that we are going to have one more open house next Thursday, where we'll, um, so if you want to invite anyone, this, that would be a good time for them to come. But then all of the global conversations are listed here. And then this is all of the content. So um, we have next week's will be what is ministry in a digital age? And it goes down here, has all that is related to that topic here. You know, obviously work that makes sense to you. Um, so I think that's, those are the main things, the main overview of this. But please let me know if there's anything I could do to assist or support in the process. So as you're doing this certificate, Any, yeah. as, as you're doing this certificate, ask the question, WWJD, what would Jonathan do? Um, because if you notice, Jonathan has put in comments in the forum, they're thoughtful, they open up conversation. We all need to be doing it because that's where the strength of this happens. We get to meet each other. And so Jonathan, thank you for being an overachiever as you always are. 
Uh, but adding things to those forum conversations really make a difference. So go ahead, yeah, I'm sorry. And we are expecting some more waves of registration. So just because it started or opened July 14th doesn't mean that it's, you're behind. You can join anytime and work through it. Um, I think that was it. Do you have anything else? So same make? time, so next, <laughs> next week, same time, but another conversation. So same time, same Zoom. Uh, Kathy, if you close this in prayer, I'll stop the recording, but if somebody wants to stay around and just get some advice from Kathy on how to get into the LMS, happy to do that as well. So Kathy, would you close this in prayer? I'll stop the recording and then I know you'll be around to give advice to people if they're having trouble getting into the LMS. Yep. Yeah. let me pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this conversation today. Um, Jesus told us this, whether it was the great commission he was in, intent, but we've taken it as this opportunity to um, spread his love, spread his gospel, and to show his kingdom around the world. And so we thank you for even this report that's showing where there's still gaps, where it's showing the um, the opportunities that are ahead of us. God, we just ask for your creativity and innovation in us to work through them and to find ways to spread your love and, and grow the kingdom right where we are in the, in the callings and the context that you've planted us. Um, we just thank you for this time and this conversation. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.